special guests, ladies and gentlemen, staff and students. Anzac Day has always been an important part of Australia's calendar. We remember all the men and women who have served and are still serving in Australia's armed forces in peacekeeping and also in conflicts overseas. But I've always had sort of one question. And that one question is, do we only remember them today? Or should we remember them a little longer? So today my thought is, if we know some stories, if we know who these people are, if we know where they come from and what they've done, we'll remember them. It's our job to remember them and pass the stories on to, to um, ancestors and, and people and the next generation so that they will also remember. It's important we remember what they've done. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are advised that this presentation may contain images, words and names of deceased persons. Today I will be sharing the stories about First Nation men and women and their contributions to Australian services. They came from all over Australia. They served in all conflicts and all services and continue to do so. But their service before 1962 held very special significance. Proud young men. We're not citizens, yet we're willing to die for this place. We're willing to die for non-Indigenous Australians. Have a think about that one. Gary Oakley is a First Nation vet working as a researcher and curator at Australian War Memorial. It was not until 1962 that all First Nation people were given the right to vote. Australia's first experience with conflict was to support the British in the war against the Dutch settlers in South Africa. Each Australian state sent mounted troops to South Africa and Australian in, uh, Indigenous Australians wanted to be part of that. A young First Nation trooper called Rossiter is believed to come from Winton in Western Queensland. While another young man who joined the uh, Queensland uh, horse was George Madigan. He's now buried in the Ing uh, Ingham Cemetery in North Queensland. Walter Parker initially sought to join the 1st uh, West Australian Regiment, but his attempt the first was unsuccessful. And it may be because of who he was. So his second attempt was more successful and he joined the 5th West Australian Mounted Infantry. More than 100 years on, it is still not clear how many Indigenous men served in South Africa. But the interesting story is that Lord Kitchener sent a telegram to Edmund Barton, who was the first Prime Minister of Australia, asking for bush trackers. They were called black trackers in then. First Nation men who were employed by police forces in Queensland and the other states to track down criminals in the bush. Nobody's quite sure how many went over there and nobody's quite sure actually what happened to them. It's an interesting story. A young black tracker is called Billy. He had to track five officers across the plains, the Velt in South Africa, to prove his worth. Interesting, the tracker first stating that the men had chosen various routes. He described how one had got off his horse and had a cigarette. He showed the match. And he called another guy, he was a silly fellow. He dismounted, took his shoes off and started to walk to put the tracker off. He cut his foot and the black tracker held up a piece of the sock to say, here's the evidence. They were worth their while. They were so good that Australian officers used to bet with the English officers on how well they were. They disagree on the number, historians. They're not quite sure how many. One argument is that Barton sent about 50 trackers and records show that only four, only four returned to Australia. They left them there. There are now stories of descendants of these men in, living in South Africa. 
Nobody's quite sure why they were not enlisted as soldiers. They were there in a different capacity. And some historians believe it was the Immigration Act of 1901, sometimes called the White Australia Policy, where they had to reapply to come back into their own country. It was difficult. World War I, right, was, was the next really big war. Began in 1914, Australia pledged to send men to Great Britain in the struggle against Germany. Although First Nation men and women wanted to volunteer, there were some restrictions. The Defence Act says, if they were not substantially of European uh, origin or descent, they weren't allowed to join. In other words, if they were black. The government gave guidance to the enlisting officers. In 1916, Aboriginals, half-castes or men with Asiatic blood are not to be enlisted. This applies to all coloured men. This was later amended due to the high casualties on the Western Front. Half-castes may be enlisted in the Imperial Force, provided that the examining medical officers is satisfied that one of them has European parents. It was usually up to the enlisting officer. Some First Nation men wanting to enlist walk hundreds of kilometres to a place where they weren't known to join up. Others changed their names. Others made up stories about where they came from so that people wouldn't think that they were First Nation Indigenous people. We're not quite sure why they joined. Loyalty and patriotism obviously plays a big part, but also love of country. There was also the incentive of a wage. This would have been the first time that some of them actually earned a wage. And in the army, they were paid the same wage as the other diggers, first time. They were treated just the same, unlike in society as a whole. Australia is the only country of the Allied forces that did not allow their Indigenous people to join. New Zealand has had some proud Maori battalions. The North Americans allowed um, their Indigenous people to join. Australia, for some reason, no. The first battle in Australia, the one we commemorate today, the 25th, the landing at Gallipoli. Listen carefully, these are real people, these are real stories. Arthur Brown, Arthur Sinclair and Arthur Williams, the three black Arthurs they were called, from Tweedshire, just south of here in northern New South Wales. They wanted to fight for Australia and country. Miss Macdonald, a descendant of Arthur Brown said, it was a huge responsibility to protect Australia, but also to protect country. The obligation to country was foremost in their minds. The trio travelled to Lismore to enlist, but Arthur Brown and Arthur Williams were refused by the Australian Army because they were considered, you're right, too black. But Arthur Sinclair had lighter skin and could prove one of his ancestors was from English descent and got accepted. The other two men then travelled to Brisbane and they enlisted there. Arthur Brown and Arthur Sinclair fought at Gallipoli where Mr Brown, aged 18, was killed during the final attempts by the British to capture the Gallipoli Peninsula. 18 years old, some of you boys here and girls, 18 years old, your age. His body was never found. Arthur Sinclair was shot in the head at Gallipoli and lost an eye. He was sent home. He was also suffering from tuberculosis. Mr Sinclair never fully recovered from his injury and illness and for years complained of a toothache. He finally went to the dentist. And after years of pain, and to everybody's surprise, including the dentist, they found the bullet that shot his eye out, lodged in his jaw underneath the sore tooth. Historians are unsure how many first Australian soldiers fought at Gallipoli, as their enlistment papers did not specify their background. Many soldiers were transferred to the Western Front. William Castles, First Nation soldier from Rudy Hill, 
in Parramatta. He was a great-grandson of Yaramundi, chief of the Baruga Bangal clan of the Darug. Very famous. He first volunteered in December 1914, but was discharged. He was frightened of the needle. But he must have built up some courage because the second time he got the inoculation and he joined. Interestingly, the first time he joined, they said his skin was dark. The second time, it was brown. So obviously, brown is better than dark. He served with a friend of his, Percy Freeman, in France, 1916, at the slaughter at Fromel and the Hindenburg Line. They became casualties within days of each other. Freeman was killed on the 18th of May and Castles was wounded, both legs, his left hand and his knee. After spending three months in hospital suffering from kidney condition, he was discharged and on the 27th of September, he died at sea on the way home. Private Richard Martin, he joined 1914. He declared on his papers that he was from Dunedin in New Zealand, that he was Maori. He had five years prior experience in the Australian Light Horse. He was actually born on Stradbroke Island. It was the one way that he knew he could get into uh, um, the army. He was transferred to the 47th Battalion and went on to serve in France. He was wounded in action on the 9th of August 1916. He was wounded again in action on the 7th of June 1917. He was wounded a third time on the 13th of October 1979, uh, 1917 sorry, with a gunshot wound to the right hand. He rejoined his battalion was killed in action a month later. Some records suggest that he was buried in the cemetery at Dernancourt, but a later document suggests that his grave was never found. Harry Thorpe, born on Lake Tears, mission station near Lakes Entrance, Victoria. He enlisted in Sale in 1916. He joined the 7th Battalion. He was wounded in action at Posiers and again at Bullecourt. He became a Lance Corporal he was awarded the Military Medal and promoted to Corporal for his conspicuous courage and leadership shown during the operation at Broodsint near Ypres in Belgium on the night 4th 5th of October 1917. Remember, these are real people. During the advance on the 9th of August 1918 at Lyons Wood, a stretcher bearer found Thorpe shot in the stomach. He died shortly later and is buried in the Heath Cemetery. His friend William Rawlings, another Aboriginal military medal winner, was killed on the same day. Trench war warfare was all challenging. Boredom was a problem. When there was no battle, you had to stand in cold water. But that was the least of their worries. They had to put up with the mud. They had to put up with rats. They had to put up with gas attacks. They had to put up with trench foot circulation and their feet was cut off and their toes fell off from standing in freezing cold water for months on end. But then they had to put up with the ever mind-numbing artillery barrages. They put up with that barrage sometimes for weeks on end. I played that to a history class one day and after five seconds they wanted me to turn it off. Soldiers had to endure these barrages for weeks, 70% of all casualties in World War I from artillery. After the trenches they had to go over the top, across no man's land. When diggers went over the top, they then heard the terrifying sound of a German water-cooled Maxim machine gun. It had an effective range of 2,300 metres. It sprayed 500 rounds a minute into the attacking troops. First Nations soldiers and their digger mates experienced these deadly machine guns all along the Western Front. 
First Nation troopers were also involved in the Middle East theatre. Private Ling Wadok was a cabby cabby man from Queensland. He worked in cattle and was known to be a very good horseman. He was a member of the 11th Light Horse Regiment that was involved in the 1917 Battle of Beersheba. It was viewed as Australia's most significant victory of World War I. The Light Horsemen did not dismount to fight, but attacked the trenches and guns and the town to secure the wells. Stretcher bearers, doctors and nurses worked tirelessly to help the wounded. Marion Leanne Smith was a Darug woman from New South Wales. She was born in Liverpool in 1891 and is the only recorded First Nation woman serving in Europe in World War I. When Marion was two years old, her parents moved to Canada where she was raised. She trained as a nurse at the New England Hospital and after graduating joined the Victorian Order of Nurses in Montreal. When World War I began, she joined the 3141 Canadian nurses who served in Europe and supported the military effort from Canada. If she had remained in Australia, it was unlikely that she would have been able to serve in the war. As Aboriginal women were given few opportunities to access education and the nursing training required to serve as a medical officer in the military, and also because of restrictions of Aboriginal people serving in the Defence Forces. She was given raving reports. Staff Nurse Smith has given complete satisfaction in the carrying out of her duties whilst on this train. Her work is both quickly and efficiently done. She is most capable in every way. After the war, she returned to Canada. It was not until World War II that we had our first Indigenous commissioned officer. Captain Reg Saunders served in Greece, North Africa, Papua New Guinea, and then in the Korean War. Len Waters was the first Indigenous pilot in the Australian Air Force in World War II. He was allocated a P-40 Kitty Hawk that had been dubbed Black Magic by the previous owner. He thought it was very appropriate and kept the name. Many First Nation women like Kath Walker, who became a famous poet, volunteered as nurses and signalers and made a significant contribution to the war effort. First Nation soldiers fought on the Kokoda track. They fought in Korea and Vietnam and they're still serving in Australia's armed forces. So, I put it to you today. Next time you walk near a war memorial, stop for a minute. Read the names. Remember what these men and women have sacrificed. It is our job to remember their stories and pass them on so that they are never, ever forgotten. <laughs>